Prepare yourself now as God's teacher for this hour, Dr. Howard C. Estep brings the prophetic message, When God Evacuates the Church. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most exciting experiences that any individual will ever experience. There's coming a time when the Bible says that every individual believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will be evacuated from this earth. I'm talking about when God evacuates the church. There's coming a time when the sound will be given in the heavens, the trumpet will blast, and then the believers in the ground, their bodies, which have lain there, some of them for hundreds, yea, even thousands of years, will come alive. They'll stand upon the earth. Those of us who have never died, we will be changed in a moment of time. And then the Bible says that God will just lift us off of planet earth. He's going to evacuate us. When God evacuates the church. Webster says to evacuate means to remove the contents. To remove the contents or to send away to another destination. You remember in the wars that we've had overseas in years gone by when they evacuated a community or they evacuated the troops, they just sent in the helicopters and they picked them up and they evacuated them. They lifted them up and they took them over to another area and sat them down and they were in a new place. They evacuated them. You see, we've been living on this sin-scarred earth for literally thousands of years, man has. One of these days, God is going to take from this earth every single individual who calls the name of Jesus Christ as Savior. And that's something exciting. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't it thrilling to know that one of these days, all of your aches and pains and all of your disappointments and all of the persecution and all of the misunderstandings and all of these things which have, which have so, so, oh, they've, they've pressed down upon you till you've thought many, many times, I just can't go on another moment. All of those things will be soft when God evacuates the church. Who is the church? Is it the Presbyterians down there? Methodists? Pentecostal, Baptists, our Catholic friends down there, Congregationalists, Pentecostals, huh? Who is it? Who is it? Who's the church? Why, you can't come along and say, we're the church, we're the church, we're the church, we're the church, no, we're the church, no, we're, the you can't do that. Because Jesus Christ never did establish one single denomination. Now, that may shock you, and it may hurt uh, your theological uh, brand that you have on yourself because of the place you go to worship on the Lord's Day, but just go back in Scripture, and you cannot find any Scripture where Jesus Christ established a single denomination. Now, I know we have some dear, precious people who call themselves Church of Christ, and they say, we're Christ's church. May I say, they are a part of Christ's church because Christ never established any, any given denomination. He said to Simon Peter at Caesarea Philippi up in the northeast corner of the state of Israel almost 2,000 years ago, he said to Simon, Who do you say that I am? And Simon said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto you, but my Father, my Father in heaven, and admission into my church will be by this confession that you receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And that's the way you get into the church. The body of Christ is by believing and receiving Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, irregardless of denomination. Now, I hope I'm not too severe with you as we get started because I want you to stay with me and hear and see all of this sermon because we've gone to a lot of effort. Television crew is here and the staff of people running the electronic uh, machines 
to capture this on tape for you, and I want to help you. I want to thrill you. I want to give you a new hope. I want to show you something in this message that you've never known before. I want to show you the hope chest that you have as an individual. Every individual has a hope chest. When that little girl is about to be married and she has that hope chest in her bedroom and she starts putting things in there secretively as it were, she's putting things in her hope chest that she's going to use later on. And may I say that every Christian has a hope chest. And I'm going to reveal it to you in this message. And you're going to learn something that you never knew before right out of the Word of God. One great body of people, the church, only the church has the promise of being removed, evacuated from this earth. Over the centuries of time, this has been known as the blessed hope, the blessed hope. Who is the church? Well, let's take a little reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, looking at verse 13, the apostle Paul, a great student of the scripture. Paul says, for by one spirit, in my Bible, that's a capital S, referring to the third person of the Godhead, for by one spirit, Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body. Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Catholics, Pentecostals, Southern Baptists, American Baptists, Bible Baptists, Evangelicals, Fundamentalists, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. There's your church. There's your church. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came the first time, you will remember, there were just Jews present, just some Jews. Because it says in the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This is referring to the apostles and the disciples. They were all gathered in one building, in one room. They were there for one purpose. They were there waiting the coming of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. What an experience. Suddenly, as a rushing mighty wind, fresh from heaven, came the Holy Spirit of God into that upper room. And these men gathered there waiting the coming of the Holy Spirit they were empowered by this Spirit. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it, the Holy Spirit, sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, translated other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Isn't that amazing? God's been so good to the Jews. Of all of the people upon the face of the earth, he has probably showed more kindness and more mercy to the Jews than any other people who have ever walked upon planet earth. They get the infilling of the Holy Spirit first. They get the baptism of the Holy Spirit first on the day of Pentecost. But Simon Peter, one day, about eight years later on this occasion, was asleep up on the housetop, so it says. Over there, they use the top of the house, which is a flat surface. They use it more or less like we would use a sun deck or we would use a, a playroom. Up there they have flowers and they have pots and they're growing shrubs and they have their hammocks and they eat up there and sleep up there. Peter's up there taking a little afternoon snooze and he was awakened. And the Spirit of God said to Simon Peter, 
I want you to go up the coast to Caesarea. Go up to Caesarea by the sea. I have a Gentile soldier up there, Cornelius, and Cornelius needs to be saved. Cornelius and his household need to receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter, I want you to go up there and talk to this Gentile about salvation. Why, Peter said, I'm a Jew. I can't associate with dogs. You know I've never been involved in anything unclean. God says, I want you to go up to Caesarea. Cornelius is up there. He needs salvation. His household needs salvation. And isn't it marvelous that God sent a Jew to convert the Gentiles? And today it's the Gentiles who are being sent to convert the Jews. I want you to go up to the house of Cornelius and tell him about Jesus. Notice what it says in the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 44. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. What's he talking about? Well, over in the first part of chapter 10, beginning in verse 34, Peter is at the home of Cornelius. And beginning in verse 34, Peter opens his mouth and he begins to tell them about the gospel. He begins to reveal the plan of salvation to them. And then when we get to verse 44 of the same chapter, chapter 10, and while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. He's there by the sea, Caesarea by the sea. He's in the house of a, of a Gentile, Roman soldier. And as Peter is preaching, suddenly the Holy Spirit comes. Now you notice there, it doesn't say here that the Holy Spirit came as a mighty rushing wind. It doesn't say that. But the Holy Spirit came. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. There was some saved Jews with Peter, and they were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues. That's languages. Now don't can get this confused. This is not an unknown tongue. There is no such teaching in the Bible as an unknown tongue. This is a language, a language that you can hear and understand. And they heard them speak with tongues, languages, and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They said, Peter, would you stay a little longer? Stay, stay a few days and explain this new experience to us. Come on, Peter, uh, stay a few days. We have there the gospel coming first to the Jew and then coming to the Gentile. But today the, the gospel is going out to everybody. The gospel is going out by television. It's going out by radio. It's going out by international shortwave. It's going out by the printing press. It's going out by hundreds of thousands, yea, maybe even millions of churches all over planet Earth. The gospel, the gospel. What for? To get people saved. And you know something? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. With all of this effort that's being put forth to get out the gospel, there are more people today unsaved than there has ever been in the history of mankind. More people unsaved. More people lost. More people on their way to hell. More people signing their own death warrant because they're turning their backs upon the gospel and upon the very Christ that came to die and give his life a ransom for them. But God's going to evacuate the church. Oh, yeah. 
God's going to evacuate the church. Absolutely. The church is not a building. Why don't we get that out of our minds once and for all time? Let, let's just, just get a hold of it like a cobweb and just wipe it out of your mind. The church is not the building. We have here at this establishment an auditorium called the King is Coming Auditorium. We have with this a fellowship called the Believer's Fellowship. But that Believer's Fellowship is just where a group of people meet in the King is Coming Auditorium. Those who are saved in the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Catholic Church or the Pentecostal Church or the, uh, some other church, those that are saved in that church are members of the body of Christ. And being a member of that particular physical church is just incidental. It's not important at all. The church is not a building. Let me give you the simplest form of a church. This may uh, frighten you a little bit. I'm looking at the book of Matthew, chapter 18, beginning in verse 20. For where two or three, <laughs> that's a big crowd, isn't it? And you know there are a lot of churches don't have more than two or three on Sunday nights. You know that? Across America and across Europe and other places, there are some churches don't have more than two or three. Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the middle of them or the midst of them. That's the simplest form of a New Testament church where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of that body. Let me give you a little idea of a time slot that I've put on the writing surface so you'll know what we're talking about and you'll have an overall concept of where we are in the overall master plan of God because God has a master plan from Genesis 1-1 up through Revelation 22. God has a master plan. In Genesis 1-1, we have God creating a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. Then God picks up a handful of dirt and he makes a man by the name of Adam. He takes a rib out of Adam, makes a woman, gives them the power of sexual reproduction, and they reproduce their kind. And then from Adam to Abraham, uh, 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 about 2,000 years, roughly 2,000 years, from Abraham to the first Advent or the first coming when Jesus came to the earth as a baby about 2,000 years. These are rough figures, round figures, approximate. From the first coming to the second Advent, another 2,000 years. And prior to the second Advent, we have what we call the rapture. And if the word rapture bothers you, uh, forget about it. Let's insert the word translation. It means the same thing. People come to me and they say, Brother East Step, uh, you, you, you preached something that wasn't in the Bible. I said, I did. Tell me about it. Well, you talked about the rapture and you can't find the word rapture in the Bible. <laughs> well, I know that. I know that. But the tra word translation is in the Bible. The translation is when God evacuates the church. God's going to evacuate the church prior to the second advent. And then the war of Armageddon is fought and then Jesus returns to the earth in a personal body. It says his feet, F-E-E-T, shall stand upon the Mount of Olives before Jerusalem on the east. And he's coming back to the city of Jerusalem to rule in that city and to govern the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords for 1,000 years. And then the Bible says... Everybody has to go to the white throne judgment. And at the white throne judgment, all unbelievers are judged. And after they're judged and condemned and damned and doomed, then they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. And they're going to exist in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And while the lake of fire, a correction, while the white throne judgment is going on, then the Bible says that this earth is going to be destroyed by fire and it's going to be obliterated and there won't be this present earth 
all of these beautiful buildings and these condominiums and these islands where these rich people have made these actually a living paradise, these marvelous $150,000 Rolls Royce and all of these fine airplanes and these marvelous palaces that these rich people have built, all of these things must be burned to cinders, to ashes. They'll no longer exist. I'm going to deal on that. I'm going to show you exactly when it happens. I'm going to read the scripture. And out of all of this chaos that's coming up on this earth, God is going to evacuate the church, going to evacuate us. Take us to a better place, better than any of these islands or these fancy places that these multimillionaires have, better than anything that they have. We're going there to live eternally when we come back to the new heaven and the new earth, according to Revelation chapter 21, when God evacuates the church. It was Jesus Christ who gave us the promise of evacuation over in the gospel according to the book of John. John's gospel, chapter 14, looking at verses 1 through 3, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. In the Greek language, this word mansions can be translated without doing any harm to the scriptures as resting places. Now, some people have the idea that God has gone up there and Christ is up there and they've got a bunch of heavenly carpenters and they're building houses, bungalows, up and down streets in heaven. I've heard this, I've heard this preached in pulpits in America that we're going to go up there and we're going to get the key to our little bungalow and we're going to go in, it's going to be furnished and we're going to live in that little bungalow forever. But that's not what the scripture teaches really. In my Father's house are many resting places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I will come again and evacuate you from the earth, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Isn't that nice? Jesus is going to come back one of these days. He's going to take us to a better place. Oh, it's true. Christians today have a difficult time. Christians today, generally speaking, are persecuted by the government. The governments of this world, and I'm not singling out any particular government. I'm making it plural. I'm saying that the governments of this world persecute the Christians. In some places, the Christians suffer death for being a Christian. In some places, Christians are identified as Christians and they're treated as substandard citizens. Even in America, if you name the name of Jesus Christ and let it be known to government officials, you can suffer punishment even in USA because you are a child of God. And all kinds of hazardous things happen to Christians, even in America, not to mention other countries of the world. But Jesus says, I'm going away. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when I get this place prepared for you, I'm going to come back and I'm going to evacuate you from off the earth and I'll take you to that new marvelous place where we're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. The Apostle Paul makes much about this. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he goes into a bit of detail, and he must have gone into detail for a reason because he wants us to know. Now, we're not to treat this lightly, my friends, because Paul the Apostle says in 1 Thessalonians, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. There's an old English word here, prevent, which we don't use anymore. But it means that we who are alive and remain shall not 
uh, go ahead of those, that is when the evacuation takes place, will not go ahead of those who have died who are in their graves. That's what Paul's saying. He's trying to put it in everyday language so we can understand it. Paul knew that some of us didn't have much education. We hadn't been through the halls of learning. We hadn't gotten our sheepskin and to be a little difficult. So Paul's just writing it in simple, everyday plow handle language. Notice what he says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now what does that say to me? It says, each step, there will be Christians living on the earth when the translation or the evacuation takes place. There will be Christians living here who have never died because the dead in Christ are going to rise first, verse 17, then we which are alive and remain, meaning to say some of us will never die. I don't think I'll be one of them personally because, you know, my body is getting worn out. I'm, my, my body, uh, you know, when you've been preaching almost 50 years and you've got white hair and and you've got wrinkles and you're stooped beneath the weight of your years and every time you get up, your joints hurt and when you sit down, your joints hurt and when you lie down, your joints hurt. You know, your body's wearing out. You, you, you couldn't possibly last a lot longer. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? He's going to evacuate us. I know one dear little black lady uh, who is in the hospital. I see her every once in a while. And she has a leg amputated right up to her hip. And she's blind. She can't see. And she can't walk. They bring her in a wheelchair and they take her out in a wheelchair but she's got a nice smile on her face. And she said to me recently, said, uh, aren't you Dr. Estep? I said, yes. She says, I thought I recognized your voice. She said, I used to listen to you on daily radio. And I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes, sir, I was a Christian. That's all I'm living for, just waiting for Jesus to come and take me home. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, praise God. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Shall we ever? We'll always be with Him. He'll never go anywhere that we don't go. If He goes over on another planet somewhere, we go with Him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, the Apostle Paul is elaborating on the evacuation. He wants us to know about it. He doesn't want to keep this thing a mystery. The evacuation is not a mysterious something, absolutely not. Paul further goes into this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, looking at verses 51 through 53. Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. Each step, I'm going to tell you something you didn't know before. Body of Christ, let me, let me brighten your future for you. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, die. There will be Christians living at the evacuation who have never died. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, get a new body. Little black lady, going to get a new leg. Little black lady, going to a new set of eyes. Little black lady, going to get a beautiful glorified body, much like unto the body of the Lord Jesus. But we shall all be changed when and how? In a moment. You know what a moment is? A moment is like that. As fast as this, 
the lightning can come from the west to the east, that's how fast it'll be. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. <laughs> immortality. Never again will I ever die. Never again will the pang of death, will you feel it, because you would have put on the clothing of immortality. And nothing, nothing can take immortality away from you once Jesus Christ gives it to you. Oh, my friends, the church is going to be evacuated. God knows who's in the church. God knows who's truly born again. God knows who's received Jesus as Savior. God knows who's a hypocrite. God knows who is putting on. God knows who is a falsy. And all of the falsies and the hypocrites and those who are putting on, they'll all be left behind to go into the awful tribulation period. But the true, born-again, Holy Spirit-baptized believers will be evacuated, caught up in the clouds of glory, to go yonder to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I was thinking the other day that maybe one of these space machines will be circling uh, the earth will be going around the earth in a, in, a, in a maneuver. And when the evacuation takes place, we'll just be caught right up and we'll see those guys as we go by them if they aren't Christians. If they're Christians, they'll get out of the spaceship and go with us. But we'll look out and say, hey, we've gone up in the clouds. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? This is all a possibility. You say, East Step, you're, you're letting your imagination run wild. You're, you're reading into the Scripture something that isn't there. No, I'm not. I'm telling you that we're going to get a body of immortality and we're going to get a new body, much like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going up to glory to be with Him. And the Bible says that we're going to be with Him forever and ever and ever. Absolutely. Well, you say, this teaching of the evacuation, or the rapture, as you like to call it. Uh, this is a comparatively new teaching. There was a little girl, I think her name was McDonald, a hundred years ago. She had uh, a high fever, and she was delirious, and she was out of her mind, and she had some kind of a vision, and uh, she told some preachers uh, about this rapture business, and that's the the rapture business isn't very old. It's just like a hundred years or so. Some little girl thought it up. She had it in a vision. She dreamed a dream or something. My friends, that is satanic garbage. With respect to the little girl, if there was such a little girl, that is satanic garbage. The apostle Paul teaches very plainly 2,000 years ago the translation of the church, the evacuation of the church, the rapture of the church. And I don't care who denies this and who says it isn't right and is isn't Scripture. I tell you, those people that would argue this is not Scripture, they are bereft of their theological senses. They cannot add two and two make four theologically or they wouldn't go around spewing such venom trying to throw you off track and off course. Why, even King David, the beloved singer of Israel, knew about the rapture of the church. You didn't know that? Turn to the Psalms. Turn over to Psalm 90. Notice what King David has to say. The writer of the Psalms. Here it is. This is Psalm 90, looking at verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. That's 70. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow. The writer of the psalm is saying that if you live to 80 years, if you sleep on a pedipostic mattress, and you put a plywood board in between the mattress and, uh, 
and the springs and you keep your spine straight and you have your window open and you drink 10 glasses of water a day and you eat organic vegetables and, and all of that kind of stuff, you might live to be 80. But the writer of the psalm says, what are you going to get out of it? Labor and sorrow. <laughs> Isn't that something? Labor and sorrow. That's all you're going to get out of 80 years. For it, your life, for it is soon cut off. Now watch this. And we fly away. <laughs> we fly away. That's what he says in Psalm 90, verse 10. We fly away. There's going to be the evacuation. There's going to be the rapture. There's going to be the translation. David knew all about it. We fly away. It's coming, my friends, just as sure as my name is what it is and your name is what it is. We fly away. Why? One of the reasons, there are many. This is the earth. We're living on the earth. This earth has down inside a fire which was begun by God in the book of Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. That fire was begun because of Lucifer's actions up in heaven when a third of the angels revolted and Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, came down to this earth, led astray the sexless beings that inhabited the earth before Adam. And then God caused a flood of water in Genesis 1-9 to cover the entire earth. And then God in his anger, when God visualized what was going on, that this angel which he had created to hover over his throne up in heaven had caused all of this dissension. God became so angry that he started a fire down inside the earth. Now God is going to destroy this earth one of these days. This magnificent, beautiful earth is going to be destroyed by fire. Notice what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. But the day of God, it says here the day of the Lord, it literally should be translated the day of God or day of Jehovah. But the day of God or Jehovah will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now I was saying a few moments ago, all of these magnificent pleasure places that the rich people of this world have created and there's some beautiful places in this world. That's why us Several million people every year go over to Hawaii. It's a beautiful, magnificent series of islands over there, tropical islands. I served in the Navy many years ago, stationed in Honolulu. I was there for nine months, so I know that Honolulu and the Hawaiian Islands is a magnificent place. And there are places, my friends, all over the world that would make Hawaii look like a garbage dump. There are beautiful places. Magnificent homes. I was looking at uh, a television show the other evening and one lady uh, living in New York City in a $3 million apartment has 10 bedrooms. And she has a flock of maids and chauffeurs and doormen and people waiting on her. All of that's going to be destroyed. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Seeing then that these beautiful, magnificent places are going to be destroyed, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Seeing that all of this magnificence that you're laying up for your retirement or for a rainy day is going to be burned up and destroyed, what kind of a person ought you to be? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, 
wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervor and heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I'm not laying anything up for a rainy day. I don't have a retirement fund. I don't even have Social Security. I don't own one penny of this earth's wealth personally. I depend day by day by day upon God and His mercy. And when I die, there'll be enough of my friends that'll bury me. My friends, don't lay up for a rainy day. And I hear this so much. I want to lay up for my retirement. I want to lay up for a rainy day. You see, when you lay up for a rainy day, you force God to send a rainy day. You say, God, I've got 17,000 laid up here for a rainy day. When's it going to rain? God says to one of the angels, pull that switch over there and let him have a little water. And you have a car wreck or you have a heart attack or your wife dies suddenly. Your house catches a fire. Well, you've been waiting for it. You've been wanting a rainy day. Now you're getting it. Trust God. Believe God. Rely upon God. God can supply. God can supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Absolutely. Your responsibility, what is it? To be faithful. To be faithful to God. Absolutely. Be faithful. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, looking at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Not in vain in the Lord. The psalmist said, you may reach 70. Perchance you may reach 80. If you do, you're going to have labor. You're going to have persecution. You're going to have aches and pains. And then at last, you fly away. God's going to evacuate the church. I want to tell you something that possibly you don't know. Did you know that the word coffin is only mentioned one time in the Bible? Coffin. Just a plain old coffin, that box they put you in when you die. Way over in Genesis 50, verse 26, the word coffin mentioned one time. Notice what it says. So Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin. That's the only time that word appears in the Bible. They put him in a coffin in Egypt, and they hauled his bones back up to the land of Canaan. You know what this coffin is, really? That's symbolic of the Christian's hope chest. Huh? You know we have a hope chest? That coffin that they put Joseph's body in down in Egypt is symbolic of our hope chest. You see, we are hoping the blessed hope. We are waiting for our blessed hope to come from heaven and take us home to be with him. We're waiting for him to evacuate us. Notice what it says here. I want to read two verses of Scripture. In Psalm number 16, verse 9, notice what it says. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. You know what that coffin is when they put us in it? You know when they take us over to the, to the uh, mortuary and they put us in that box 
You know what that box is? It's my hope chest. It's their hope chest if you're a Christian. They're putting us in a box. They're putting us in the hope chest. That's what the psalmist is saying here in 16 verse 9. My flesh also shall rest in hope says practically the same thing in the book of Acts. Notice what it says. There it is, Acts 2.26. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Don't worry about dying. Don't worry about leaving this old world. Paul has clarified the thing so beautifully in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says that whenever we put you in that box, the coffin, that's your hope chest. You're going to lie in there and you're going to rest in there and you're going to await the evacuation. And one of these days at an hour when we least expect it, the trumpet sound will blast forth from the glory land and you will wake up in your hope chest and you will get up. You'll wipe the sleep from your eyes and you'll stretch your muscles and you'll look around and here's all these other Christians who haven't died and then suddenly changed in a moment of time, caught up, taken to glory to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. A railroad engineer was speaking to a bunch of men one day at a luncheon, and he told them a story. He said, coming into the station in New York, we came around a long bend. And as we came around this long bend, I could look across the river and I could look up on a knoll, a little hill, and up there was a white house, a little old farmhouse painted white. And I could always see my mom and dad sitting up there on the front porch. My mom would always wave as I came around the curve with my engine, pulling it into New York City to the terminal. And mom would wave and I couldn't see her lips move, but mom told me later on that every time I came around the curb and she knew that I was home for the night, she would say, thank God, Benny's home tonight. And then mom died. And we put her body in the hope chest and we lowered it into the ground and covered it with the dirt and put a blanket of beautiful, sweet-smelling flowers on it and we went away with tear-stained faces Mom wasn't there anymore, but I still ran the engine. And every day when I would come around the big bend going into New York City to the terminal, I would look up on the hill, and there I would see an old man sitting in a rocking chair, and feebly he would wave to me. He would just wave, and Dad told me later I couldn't hear him naturally, but he said, thank God Benny's home tonight. Thank God Benny's home tonight. And one day, Dad died. We took his body out to the cemetery. It was placed in the hope chest, the coffin. We put his body beside Mom's, and we put the dirt in, and we covered it over with a blanket of sweet-smelling flowers. And we went away with broken hearts because we knew we wouldn't see him again here on the earth. And, and then I still had to run my engine. I run my engine just the same. And every evening, just before the sun would set, as I came around that bend on my way into New York City to the terminal, I would look up on the hill and somebody else had bought the farm place and there was nobody sitting on the front porch waving. But I could imagine that mom and dad were up in glory and both of them were waving and they were saying, thank God Benny's home tonight. Benny's home tonight. Can you honestly and truthfully say down in your heart that you know that you're a member of the body of Christ 
You've been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though they put your body in a hope chest before the translation of the church or the evacuation of the church, that you will be resurrected on the resurrection morning and you will go yonder into the celestial city of God. Do you have that, do you have that hope? You must. You must have that hope. You must believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary to forgive you of your sins and to save you for time and eternity. Thank God Benny's home tonight. <laughs> <laughs>